Hello, welcome to part 8. Today we will implement the kernel GDT and we will begin our work on interrupts. We have a lot of work to do, so let's get straight to it. Before working on the kernel, there are some bugs that I found and I would like to show you those fixes. Let's start with the build process. In part 7, I showed how to automate downloading and building binutils and GCC. When running the binutils build, I would get these segmentation errors caused by a program called Chew, which would crash. I could reproduce this issue on some distributions, Ubuntu and Debian, but on other distributions like Fedora it worked fine. It took me a while to find the source of the problem, which turned out to be these variables in config.make. CC, C flags, LD and all these other variables are very commonly used in makefile projects. Exporting them means that they are passed as environment variables to child processes, which will also include the binutils and the GCC builds causing them to misbehave. The easiest way to fix this issue would be to set them to empty when calling the configure scripts of binutils and GCC. Like this, C flags equals nothing, ASM flags equals nothing, and the same with all the others. Since we are changing things in this toolchain.make file, let's also fix this annoyance where running make toolchain rebuilds binutils and GCC every time, even if they are already built. We can fix this issue by introducing an intermediate target, which is a real file that is generated by the build. This way, make will see that there is a real file that exists with that file name and will not redo the build process unless something changes. For binutils, a good option for this intermediate file would be the ld linker binary, so toolchains underscore binutils will depend on ld and the ld target will now contain all the build steps. For GCC, I used the GCC binary itself and did the same thing. Toolchain GCC depends on the GCC binary and the GCC binary target contains the build recipe. Another bug I found was in the printf implementation, both in the kernel and in stage 2. When printing a number followed by a %s string specifier, I would get a zero appended to the string. The problem was that I forgot to reset this number boolean variable after handling the specifier. After resetting the variable to false in the specifier case, the issue is gone. With those things taken care of, let's get back to the kernel and start by cleaning up our code a little bit. First, let's move all the x86 specific stuff in a new folder called arch i686. When we will add 64-bit support, we will probably have a separate arch x86 64 folder and who knows, maybe one day we will port our operating system to ARM. Let's also move the inb and outb functions, which are currently in x86.h and x86.asm, to some new files in this i686 directory, io.asm and io.h. Since the old x86 files are now empty, we can delete them. Because we changed the folder structure, we will also need to fix some things in the kernel make file. Firstly, let's add the kernel directory as an include path, this way including things will be much easier. Secondly, we are using this wildcard function which isn't recursive. So only the files in the kernel directory will be built, nothing from the subdirectories. I found three ways in which we can solve this. We could use this format, however this only seems to work with some versions of makefile, mine doesn't. Another solution could be to simply add the wildcard rule multiple times for each level of nestedness. And this is the method that I used here. After I already recorded this, I found a better solution which works to an unlimited number of nested folders, which is by using shell find. So let's fix this for both the C sources and the assembly sources. Another improvement that I wanted to make was to add the header files as dependencies. Currently, if we modify something in a header file, make will not rebuild the files where that header is included. This could create problems for us in the future, so adding the headers as dependencies will ensure that whenever we change something, these changes will be included into the build, 
The downside of this approach is that changing a header file will trigger all the C files to be rebuilt. Fixing this is a lot more difficult, we would need a smarter build system that can parse C files and basically build a header include tree. However, because this is a pretty small project and rebuilding only takes a few seconds, I'm okay with that. I also did the same with the assembly headers, we don't have any at the moment, but we will need them in the future. Finally, I added all of these headers as dependencies to our C object files and then the assembly object files. All that's left to fix in our build is to replace all the occurrences of the old x86.h file with the new io.h. And now our build is fixed. Another thing I got wrong was the Visual Studio Code C++ configuration, which is why I'm getting all of these squiggly lines. The issue is in ccpp properties.json, the compiler arguments need to be separated. Since we are editing this file, I also took this opportunity to add the freestanding C library headers to the include path. Moving on, let's continue by setting up the global descriptor table. But what exactly is it and why do we need it? Remember how in real mode memory addresses had a segment and an offset? In that context, memory was broken up into overlapping segments that were 64 kilobyte large. These were 16-bit processors, allowing the processor to access up to 1 megabyte of memory. During the development of the 286 processor, the engineers at Intel saw that it was impossible to change this segment and offset scheme without completely breaking backwards compatibility. This had to be done somehow if they wanted to break that 1 megabyte barrier set by the 8086. So they decided to create a new mode of operation called 16-bit protected mode. In this mode, segments could now be fully customized by the operating system by setting up a table called the global descriptor table. Segments were still 64 kilobytes large, the 286 was still a 16-bit processor, but the operating system could change the physical memory region assigned to each segment as well as set up access rules for these segments. With these changes, the 286 could now access up to 16 megabytes of memory. A few years later, Intel would release the 386 processor, which would finally address all of these terrible memory limitations and ugly hacks by offering a future-proof solution that would endure for many years, 32-bit. The offset in segment and offset was now a 32-bit number. Because of this change, a single segment was now enough to access the entire 4GB memory address space. On this processor, Intel also introduced paging, which, from a security standpoint, had significant advantages to segmentation. Because of this, segmentation was now deprecated. However, because this feature cannot simply be turned off, we still need to set up a minimal global descriptor table. This is exactly what we are going to do. We'll set up a GDT to give us exactly what we want. A code segment and a data segment that will allow us to access the entire 32 bits of memory. If you've been following this channel, you may remember that we've done this already when setting up protected mode in the stage 2 bootloader. So why do we need to do this again? The answer is that the bootloader set up a global descriptor table which allowed it to do the things it needed to do. For example, there are some entries which are relevant to the 16-bit protected mode, which is used as a crutch to get back to real mode. In our kernel, we have different needs. We don't need that 16-bit protected mode, but we will need some additional entries which will be required for multitasking and user land. Another problem with the bootloader GDT is that it is located inside the bootloader. At some point we may want to free up the memory where the bootloader is located because the bootloader is no longer needed. Keeping the global descriptor table there will prevent us from doing that. The last time we implemented the GDT in assembly. Today we will do it in C, but I will keep the assembly implementation open for reference. Let's begin by defining our data structures, starting with a GDT entry. This is what a segment descriptor looks like, it looks a bit messy, but let's try to untangle this mess and figure out what we have here. Starting from the bottom, we start with the limit. This is a 20-bit number, which represents the length of the segment. You may be thinking that 20 bits is not enough to specify 4 gigabytes. So how exactly can we do that? That's what the granularity bit is for. 
If the granularity bit is set to 1, the limit is no longer specified in bytes, but in 4 kilobyte blocks. Next we have the base address, which is a 32-bit number split into 3 parts. This tells the processor at which memory address this segment begins. The rest of the bits in the structure are flags that describe the access rules and other attributes of the descriptor. We'll go into more detail in just a minute. Let's now implement this structure. You may be asking, why does this look so messy and weird? A lot of it comes from backwards compatibility. The new 386 processors still needed to support the 16-bit protected mode added on the 286, as well as the ugly real mode from the 8086. And this is what happens when you engineer something to solve the problems you have in the present without thinking too much about what will happen in the future. You will end up having to do all kinds of ugly hacks just to make things work. Budget and time constraints may have also contributed. To load the GDT, we will also need the GDT descriptor structure. This contains two fields, the size of the GDT-1 and the pointer to the table itself. We don't want to have any magic numbers in the code that don't have any meaning, so let's define some enumerations for the flags. Starting with the access byte, bit 0 or the accessed bit is set automatically by the CPU when the segment is accessed. This might have been useful if we used segmentation, but since we will not be using it, we can ignore it. Bit 1 has two meanings depending on whether the segment is a code or a data segment. For code segments, this bit indicates if reading and executing are allowed or only executing. For data segments, this bit indicates if reading and writing are allowed or only reading. Bit 2 also has two meanings. For code segments, this is called the conforming bit, and it indicates whether the code is allowed to be executed in a less privileged ring. For data segments, this indicates whether the segment is expanding in the reverse direction. Yes, you can have segments that go downwards instead of upwards. Bit 3 is the executable bit and it indicates whether this segment is executable, thus a code segment, or not, which means a data segment. Bit 4, or the descriptor type bit, indicates whether this is a code or data segment, or something else like a task state segment. Because the executable bit 3 should only be set to 1 when bit 4 is 1, we can combine these two to indicate a data segment or a code segment. When both are 0, this means that this is a task state segment, we can add a constant for that as well. Bits 5 and 6 indicate the CPU privilege level or ring required to access this segment. 0 means the highest privilege and 3 is the lowest. Bit 7 indicates whether this segment is present or not. Using this bit we can enable or disable the segment if we need to. Let's also take care of the rest of the flags, which are in the other byte. Bit 4 of this field is ignored by the CPU, it is only meant to be read by the operating system. We can safely ignore it. Bit 5 indicates if this is a 64-bit segment. Bit 6 is the size flag, which indicates whether this is a 16-bit or a 32-bit segment. The documentation mentions that bit 5 should only be set to 1 when bit 6 is 0, so we can combine these two as well. Finally, we have bit 7, which indicates the granularity, and we talked about this earlier. Because it's so messy, this structure is a bit difficult to work with, so let's create some helper macros to make it easier for us to define these GDT entries. If we think about it, there are basically four things specified by this structure. The base, the limit, the access byte and the flags. So let's define a GDT entry macro which initializes this GDT entry structure and has these four things as arguments. The first field in the structure contains the lower 16 bits of the limit. So let's define another macro which gets us only the lower 16 bits of the limit. All we have to do here is apply the FFFF mask, which removes the upper bits. Same for the lower 16 bits of the base. 
for the middle portion of the base, we need to shift the base to the right by 16 bits and from that only take the lower 8 bits. Next we have the access byte that I forgot about and edited it at the end. For the flags and limit byte, we again right shift the limit by 16 bits and take only the lower 4 of the remaining bits and then to add the rest of the flags we simply or them. Finally we have the upper part of the base, same as before we shift to the right by 24 bits and then take 8 bits. Let's define our global descriptor table next. First we have the null descriptor which has all zeros for all the fields. Next we have the 32-bit code segment. The assembly code is a bit hard to read, but what we want to do here is to create a segment that starts at 0, so the base is 0. We want it to have the full 32-bit range, so the limit will be FFFF, that's 20 bits, and the granularity will be set to 4 kilobytes. For the access flags we want this segment to be present, the privilege level set to ring 0, we want this to be a code segment, and we want the segment to be readable. This is the same that we set in the assembly code. If you do the math and add up all these constants, you will get the same value as this one from assembly. Next we have the flags, where we will set the segment to 32-bit and the granularity to 4 kilobytes. Finally we have the 32-bit data segment. We can copy the code segment entry, we only need to change the type to data segment and set it to writable. Now that the GDT is done, let's create the GDT descriptor. Again, this contains two fields, the size of the GDT minus one and the address of the table. So we have the GDT, we have the GDT descriptor, all that's left to do for us is load it. We will have to write this function in assembly since the C language doesn't have any construct for the LGDT instruction. The function will take a pointer to the GDT descriptor structure as a parameter and it will also change the current code and data segments. After changing the GDT, it's always required to update the code and data segments. For the implementation, I started with all the typical stuff you do when you write a function, export it as a global symbol, then set up and clean up the call frame. The first argument is the address of the GDT descriptor, so we have to load it into a register like EAX. Something I'd like to clarify is what these brackets mean, because this is something that I got some questions about. If I write this instruction, what this means is that we are storing in EAX the number stored in EBP to which we add 8. This would be the equivalent of this written in C. If I add the brackets, this means that we are putting in EAX not the contents of EBP, but the contents of the memory at address EBP plus 8. In C, this would be equivalent to using the asterisk or the dereferencing operator. Now that we have the address of the GDT descriptor in EAX, we just load it using the LGDT instruction. Next, we will need to load the new segments into the segment registers. Starting with the code segment, we cannot really change the code segment directly. The only way to do that is to perform a far jump. There are two ways in which we can perform this jump. We could either use one of the data segments as an intermediary, for example DS, and then jump to the address DS reload CS. The other way is using the return far instruction, which in normal circumstances is used to return from a far call. But by manipulating this stack, we can trick it into jumping to what address we want. This is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm first pushing the segment I want to jump to, which is the first argument of the function, and then I am pushing the address of the reload CS label. When we invoke the retf instruction, the processor will pop the offset and segment from the stack and we perform a far jump to that address. With this out of the way, all that's left to do is to set up the other segment registers to the data segment we set as an argument, ds, es, fs and ss.
We're almost done with the global descriptor table. What's left to do is to implement an initialized function, which will call the load function to load the new GDT. To make things easier, I define two constants for the code and data segments in gdt.h. Note that these are not indices into the table, but memory offsets. This means that we have to multiply the index of the segment we want to load to the size of a descriptor, which is 8 bytes. So the code segment is at 1 multiplied by 8, which is 8, and the data segment is at 2 multiplied by 8, which is 16. One of the most important roles of the kernel is to create abstractions for the hardware. For example, files and folders are an abstraction of file systems and storage medium. This way, programmers who want to access data on the disk don't have to worry about what the underlying file system is or what the storage medium the data is stored on. This is something hidden away by the kernel. Programs interact with files and folders. And behind the scenes, the kernel will pass those requests to the corresponding file system driver and the correct hardware drivers. A pretty common design pattern used in kernels is to have a hardware abstraction layer, or HAL, which has the purpose of isolating the hardware from the rest of the kernel. While files and folders are a very high level abstraction that doesn't really belong in the HAL, some other examples of abstractions that could be part of this layer would be block devices or character devices to designate devices that can send or receive data, or frame buffer devices, these are devices that can display a raw image. Of course, not all operating systems are designed this way. However, I think that this is a great idea, and this way porting the operating system to other platforms will be much easier since most of the changes will only be in the drivers and in the hell. So let's go ahead and add the hell to our operating system. This means creating a hell subfolder and a header and source file. For now, all we will do here is to create a hell initialize function that will initialize this hardware abstraction layer. And at this moment, all that this does is call the GDT initialize function. And finally, let's not forget to call hell initialize from main.c. Time to test our operating system. Let's see what happens. And it looks like it still works. We're not getting any crashes or weird behavior. Great! Our GDT is working, so let's move on to the next topic. Interrupts. Genetic pause here. The simplest explanation is that an interrupt is a signal that the CPU has to respond to. When one such signal is received, the CPU has to stop whatever it was doing before, save its state so that it can return, and then jump to some code which can handle that interrupt signal. There are multiple types of interrupts classified based on the source of the signal. An exception is an interrupt generated by the processor itself when it detects an error condition, for example, a division by zero, or when a program is trying to do something it's not allowed to, or when the program is trying to access a memory page that's not present. When one of these situations happen, the operating system's role is to handle that situation in the most appropriate way. For example, it might have to kill that misbehaving program, or it might have to load some memory from the paging file, or it might have to ask the user for permissions. An interrupt request, abbreviated as an IRQ, also known as a hardware interrupt, is a signal generated by hardware. For example, the keyboard will generate interrupts when keys are pressed and released, the mouse will generate interrupts when it is moved, the disk controllers will generate interrupts when they complete their tasks, etc. These hardware interrupts aren't directly connected to the CPU, but to a chip called the programmable interrupt controller, which has the role of managing these hardware interrupts prioritizing them and passing them to the CPU one by one. This way, the CPU has enough time to process all the interrupts without the risk of missing any of them. These interrupts can be enabled or disabled by manipulating the interrupt flag in the CPU flags register. 
This is what the CLI and STI instructions do. When we disable this flag, the processor will ignore any interrupt request until the flag is enabled again. We will discuss about IRQs in the next video. Software interrupts are interrupts generated by the int instruction. We have used this instruction before to call the BIOS and the most common use for this type of interrupts is to implement system calls. And that's exactly what these BIOS calls are, a form of system calls where we are calling the firmware to do things for us. Now that we know what interrupts are and how they are triggered, let's see how the processor handles them. Once the processor receives the interrupt, it will save its current state so that it can return once the interrupt is handled. Then, using a special table called the interrupt vector table or the interrupt descriptor table, it will retrieve the address of the interrupt service routine associated with the corresponding interrupt number and then call that routine. Interrupts have an associated number which can be between 0 and 255. This number can be used to identify the cause of the interrupt and the device that triggered it. These interrupt service routines, or ISRs for short, are nothing more than some simple functions that are implemented in the operating system, which have the role of handling these interrupts. The only special thing about these functions is that they have to return using the special IRET instruction, after which the processor will restore its original state and continue executing the code that it was executing before. An interesting note here is that the operating system can alter the state saved by the CPU. If a process needs to be killed, then the operating system may not want to return back to the executing code. The operating system sets up a timer to fire interrupts at a regular interval, and then each time the interrupt is triggered, it saves the state of the current process and replaces it to the saved state of another process. If you do this multiple times per second, then the user will have the impression that all of the programs are running at the same time. Now let's talk a bit more about these special tables, the interrupt vector table and the interrupt descriptor table. The interrupt vector table or the IVT is only relevant on the x86 platform in 16-bit real mode and it is a very simple table that contains a list of 256 FAR pointers to functions corresponding to each of the 256 interrupt numbers. This table is stored at the fixed memory location starting from address 0. That's right, address 0. You've been lied to the whole time. Address null is not an invalid address, it is a real address that contains the interrupt vector table. In most circumstances, you don't want to overwrite the interrupt vector table, which is why it was considered a good idea to give it the meaning of an invalid address. The reason I'm mentioning the interrupt vector table is that other processor architectures like ARM still use them, so it's very useful to know about them. In protected mode, we use a slightly different table called the interrupt descriptor table. Unlike the IVT, this table can be located anywhere, the processor has a special register where it stores the address of the IDT, similar to how the global descriptor table works. Here you can see what the structure looks like. Again, very messy because of backwards compatibility and whatever happened with the 286's 16-bit protected mode. While discussing this structure, let's also create the IDT structure in C. Starting from the bottom, we have the offset, which is the memory address where the handler function is located. This value is split in two. Then we have the segment, which corresponds to an entry in the global descriptor table. For us, this will always be the code segment. This reserved byte is always zero, and then we have the flags field. Finally, we have the upper half of the offset, or the base. Same as with the GDT, we will need an IDT descriptor structure which contains the size of the IDT-1 and the pointer to the actual table. Let's continue with the flags enumeration. Here we have the gate type, which indicates whether this is a task, interrupt or trap gate. Task gates are used for hardware multitasking, they are not relevant for today's discussion. 
A trap gate means that the currently executing instruction is meant to be retried. This is the case when an exception occurs. For example, when a process is trying to access a memory page which doesn't exist, the processor will trigger a page fault, the operating system will load the missing page into RAM, and then the faulting instruction will be retried. For interrupt gates, the processor will continue with the next instruction. There's no need to retry here. Another difference between these two is that, while handling an interrupt, the processor will automatically disable the interrupt flag while the interrupt is handled. This doesn't happen for trap gates, which means that the processor can get interrupted while it is still handling an interrupt. Bit 4 is always zero, and then we have the descriptor privilege level which indicates the ring from which the corresponding software interrupt can be called. If we set this to ring 0, attempting to call the interrupt from user land will result in an exception. Obviously, this doesn't happen to exceptions and hardware interrupts. Finally, we have the present bit which indicates whether this gate is enabled or disabled. Attempting to call a disabled interrupt will result in a segment not present exception. Let's continue by implementing the load function. This only needs to take a pointer to the IDT descriptor. For the implementation, what we do here is simply call the LIDT instruction, which loads the IDT into the CPU's register. This works in the same way as the LGDT instruction we used earlier. Next, let's define our interrupt descriptor table, which will be an array of 256 IDT entries. Since this is a global variable, it should be automatically initialized to zero, so the present flag should be set to zero for all the entries by default. I also defined the IDT descriptor, which contains the size of the IDT table minus one and the pointer to the beginning of the array. Next, I defined the IDT setGate function, which modifies an entry from the table. We can modify the IDT once it's loaded without having to preload it, but it would be best to disable interrupts while doing this, because this is not an atomic operation. We need four things here, the interrupt number, a function pointer, the segment descriptor and the flags. The implementation is pretty simple, we just need to set all the fields of the corresponding descriptor to the right values. The next two functions will enable and disable gates by setting and clearing the present flag. Because setting and clearing bits is something that we have to do all the time, let's create some utility macros for doing just that. To set a flag, we need to bitwise or it to the variable, and to clear it, we need to bitwise or it with the negated flag. Finally, let's implement the IDT initialize function, which will only call the load function using the IDT descriptor we used above. After finishing the implementation, let's call this initialization function from hell initialize. 
I forgot to add the declarations of the IDT functions in IDT.h. I also moved the flex enumeration because it is needed when calling IDT set gate. After fixing these issues, our operating system works. Not very exciting, but at least we haven't broken anything. Today we implemented some of the basic infrastructure needed to get our interrupt handlers working. In the next video we will continue setting up the needed infrastructure for handling all the different types of interrupts. Thank you very much for watching. You can find links to the source code as well as some of the resources I used while making this video in the video description. We also have a Discord server if you want to join our community of people who are eager to learn about building operating systems or you simply need some help. Thank you very much and see you the next time. Have a nice day. Bye bye.